Right now our choir is going to sing about the name of Jesus. Thank you, choir. Now turn to page number 348, please. 348. And you can stand once again and let's sing My Savior's Love. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Let's play through that a time or two. Get around and shake hands with your neighbor. Tell them you're glad to have them here this morning. Okay, on that second.
Say amen. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. And right now we have Don L to come sing for you.
All right, thank you, Donnell and choir and everybody. A couple of announcements here this morning. Number one, no ladies' Bible study tomorrow night. Carla is still recuperating and trying to make sure she's feeling good, so we're going to let that go. A week from tomorrow, December 10th, yes, we will have ladies' Bible study, and that's the ministerial we. I won't be there, but uh, we will have ladies' Bible study on that night. Then on December 15th, we've got a work day here at 7 o'clock in the morning. December 26th, the day after Christmas, there will be no uh, kids program on that Wednesday night, no girls alive and no wise guys. December 30th, fifth Sunday sing and potluck after the morning service. Sing will begin at 1.30 p.m. So on the 30th, we'll have our regular service and then go over, have a bite to eat if you bring any food, and then we'll have our fifth Sunday sing. We've got a great Christmas track now, we're in the Christmas season, and a great Christmas track about steps to peace with God. And it's all outlined, it's beautiful, nice glossy track, grab some of them and hand them out. I'm not going to read the points because I'm going to preach a good salvation, well, I'm going to preach a salvation message, and it'll be good because salvation is good. We don't know how the speaker will be, but uh, I'm not going to go over the points, but you grab this, this is a fantastic track, hand some out. Let's mention birthdays today. Patsy Fenwick, not with us today, but her birthday is, um, she's 20 years older than uh, Mrs. Makaroff, which makes her 85. And Evelyn Crooks, I don't see Evelyn here today either. But we've got Norman Nina Hofer with us. 44 years of marriage. Is that right? Did I remember that correctly? Boy, oh boy. You must have married her young, Norm. They're going to go up to, I guess they're going to go up to Big Bear because 44 years ago on the honeymoon, that's where they went. So 44 years, congratulations. How about singing happy anniversary? Let's sing happy anniversary. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary, God bless you. Happy anniversary to you. Well, we've got some special guests here. Uh, Some of them I'm going to let Ben introduce. But uh, Stan's got a special guest with him. Stan? Friend Sherry, first time in the services. Sherry, thank you for coming. I already told her that she's keeping very good company, being with Stan. And uh, great to have you with us, Sherry. Anybody else here for the first time? First time, would you introduce yourself? Okay, Uh, you can tell that I'm not a young man. And my hearing isn't what it used to be. Well, thank you for coming. You live in the neighborhood, you said. Is that right? Well, boy, it's great to have you here. God bless you. Thank you for coming. All right. If I can get Benny down here and Donnell and Braden, we'd like to have a little public dedication. And, uh, yes, sir. Where is he or she? Oh, great. (coughs) Ruby. And uh, do you know anybody here? (laughs) Yeah? (laughs) Hey, Ruby, it's great to have you with us. Thank you. Well, this is uh, about to bring to the platform some of the results of Benny's evangelistic work. his wife and his baby. Now, she was already saved before he got it, but he helped disciple her. Right, Ben? Sure. Benny, would you, (laughs) sure, sure, Dad, whatever you say. Um, Would you like to introduce some of the guests that are here? Absolutely. Got a whole row of family there. You know, most of you would know my my in-laws, there's Mark Scott and Karen Fesnan, they're sitting right there in the middle. And then to my left, I think it's 
think it's their first time in a service here, but they've been around the building. Nope, Shirley's, Shirley's been here before, but that's Donnell's sister, Shirley, and Shirley's husband, Daniel. And then little Emily is next to him, and that's, uh, that's their daughter, number one, and Wyatt's sitting in, in Nani's lap. And they've got another little one in the nursery, Elena, and so uh, we're glad to have them. And then Donnell's little sister, Noelle, and her husband, Jason, and then Blake is upstairs being my photographer for the day. So we're happy to have them here with us today to witness this. All right, now I'm nervous. Because I think I'm going to try to hold Braden. <laughs> Have fun, she says. Now, uh, this is a public uh, acknowledgement, really. And uh, Ben and Donnell have uh, already, in their own private uh, time, uh, dedicated uh, Braden to the Lord. And you say, what do you, what's dedication anyway? Well, Braden belongs to God, amen? amen? And we don't christen babies and we don't baptize them because we obviously take the biblical position and baptism in the Bible is a believer's baptism. And I think Ben told me to turn my microphone on. So uh, that's, that's what we do. We baptize believers. And we believe that this uh, child, Braden, if he were to depart from this world, God forbid, uh, before an age of accountability, he'd go to be with the Lord Jesus Christ. But his salvation would take place when he could make a decision because a decision for Christ has to be made by the individual. We can't make it for them. When they reach an age where they understand the gospel, whatever that age might be, and it might vary from person to person and does. But at that point, if God answers our prayers and we believe he will, he'll become a believer. And at that time, by the grace of God, I will baptize him right here. Amen. What we're doing right here is saying, God, we acknowledge who you are, and we thank you for the gift that you've given to us. And we want to say to you, we dedicate him to you, to use him for your honor and glory. So that's what we're doing, and we're going to try to do it right now. Now, he's been listening to my voice for a long time, and uh, he seems halfway content about it. And I have to say... He just happens to be a very handsome young man, and that's completely <laughs> non-partial. Let's pray together. God, today we pause and come to you in Jesus' name. And God, we're thankful for parents that have put you first in their life and have dedicated their own lives, and God, even for grandparents and a whole family that has been simply sold out to Jesus. And God, it all comes to fruition and here you've blessed them with a baby, Braden. And God, they want to publicly say, yes, this baby belongs to God. He's entrusted Braden to us. And by the grace of God, we're going to bring him up in the nurture and the admir admonition of Jesus Christ. And Father, we pray that you'll use him in a mighty way. And God, at the appropriate time, you know what that is. He'll make his own decision to serve Jesus Christ. We look forward to that time should you tarry. And, oh, God, you're such a great God. You've blessed us and Mr. and Mrs. Fessenden and Carla and I and, and, of course, Ben and Donnell. Thank you. Thank you so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Are we doing anything now? Offering. All right, let's take an offering. If you love Braden, put some money in the pot. <clears throat> Our Father, what a great day to be here in church and God, to be in your presence, to be with other believers. And we've had Great music, great fellowship, a great opportunity to say thank you for the miracle of birth and the blessing of a baby.
And now, God, as we render to you a part of that which you've given to us, we ask you to use it for your honor and glory, for the furtherance of the gospel, and we thank you. And God, thank you for our guests and visitors here, every one of them. They're honored guests. They made our day by being here, and we just pray that they'll feel at home and feel blessed. And we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, ladies. Take your hymnals one last time, please. Page number 340. Page number 340. You can remain seated. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Sing that once again. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim. In the Right now we have Pastor Smith, Carla, and Julie to sing for you. country where no twilight shadows deepen, unending day where night will never fall, a city where no storm clouds cannot gather, oh this is just what heaven means to me. What joy it will be when we get over yonder and join the throng around the glassy sea to meet our Savior and crown Christ forever. Just what 
what heaven means to me. A place where there is no misunderstanding. And from all enmity and strife we're free. What heaven means to me And when at last I see the face of Jesus Before whose image other loves all flee And when they crown him Lord of all I'll be there. Oh, this is just what heaven means to me. What joy it will be when we get over yonder and join the throng around the glassy sea. To meet our loved ones and crown Christ forever. All oh, this is just what heaven means to me. To meet our loved ones and crown Christ forever. All oh, this is just what heaven means to me. Amen. Thank you very much. <clears throat> now, you visitors, I have to tell you something here. Uh, you come back again for another service because I don't feel like I can really deliver a good message today. I haven't had my Pepsi. <clears throat> we ran out of the Pepsi machine. I had to drink Pepsi One. I don't think there's any caffeine in that. So I'm struggling today. You'll understand that, right? All right. <clears throat> Having said that, it's a great pleasure to just come and bring Kind of an educational message. We've already talked a little about baptism and the new birth, by default, so to speak. And we don't always do those things. Sometimes we'll get into a, an Old Testament story or even a New Testament illustration. And uh, Spurgeon said, uh, what do you do? He told his preacher boys, he said, you peek at, take a text and make a beeline for the cross. So that's what we preach, for sure. But sometimes, maybe more basic, and today... Uh, very much so. And by the way, let me uh, give one more disclaimer. Some of you were expecting to see Matt uh, Hagbang publicly dedicated, and I know you're sitting there saying, oh, he didn't want to share the platform with anybody except his grandson. And uh, you're half right on that. But uh, actually, Mario said we want to wait until a later date. Uh, can you uh, give me an amen on that? Is that correct? There we go. All right. Always there for me. Thank you very much. So we'll be publicly dedicating Matt at a later date. But I have here in my hand what is called the Holy Bible. Amen. It's a collection of 66 books, 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New. And it refers to itself by many different names, such as the Word of God, the Scriptures, the Oracles of God, and particularly in terms of the Old Testament, calls itself the Prophecy. And the Bible says some very interesting things about itself. We call that internal evidence, if you will. And I'm going to read some verses to you or quote some, and we'll have time to turn to some. But for time's sake, just kind of hang on to what I'm saying for a minute. Over in 2 Timothy, Paul writes to Timothy, and he says to him, that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures. Now, I like to say, how could you know them if you didn't have them? Amen? 
I don't really like listening to people that say, well, we had the scriptures one time, but now we lost them and we don't have them anymore, but we got a reasonable facsimile. I don't like that. And Paul wrote to Timothy, he said, from a child, thou hast known the Holy Scriptures. If you want to know the Holy Scriptures, you can. And he goes on to say, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation. So they'll tell you how to be saved. And it goes on to describe that a little bit by saying, through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. And then he says, all Scripture, the whole ball of wax, amen? All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's God-breathed. And is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. That's one thing that it says about itself. And then over in 2 Peter chapter 1, the Apostle Peter, again under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, wrote this. <clears throat> he said, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So we have what we have named the Holy Bible. Now the word Bible basically means book. We've got the holy book, separated, sanctified. Uh, when we talk about holiness sometimes, we talk about sanctification, and we talk about set apart for a godly purpose. Well, this book certainly is set apart for a godly purpose. I mean, I guess you can pick up 50 uh, shades of gray somewhere in the book stand, and, you know, uh, don't raise your hand if you're reading that. But that's not set apart for a holy purpose in my mind. This is God's holy word, set apart for a holy purpose. Now, if I've offended you already, please come back next week and we'll try it again. But what we have, we have named the Holy Bible. And it names itself the Holy Scriptures, 2 Timothy 3.15. It was inspired and authored of God, the Holy Ghost, 2 Peter 1.21. And it is penned by holy men of God. So we've got the Holy Bible that we call it. God calls it the Holy Scriptures, authored by the Holy Ghost, spoken and written by holy men of God. In other words, we've got a very special Holy Bible right in our hands right now. There is no book like it. And it tells us things that can't be learned from any other source. The Bible tells us about the future. We call it eschatology. So you'll think we're smart. But it's just future doctrine. The Bible tells us about the future, sometimes specifically, sometimes in more general terms. It gives tips for successful living in books like the Psalms and the Proverbs. It gives a history of Israel and the history of man. And beyond that, it's the only place that you can learn for sure how to be in right relationship with God. That's the only book that you can learn for sure how to be in right relationship with God. With God. Apart from the Bible, we are left to our own human reasoning. Or maybe to whoever's got the best sales pitch from the pulpit. And both of those are dangerous waters to be in. When it comes to our salvation, we need to hear from God Himself. Not some man and not some little book that some man wrote. <clears throat> now, we know that our time on earth is limited. We can figure that out all by ourselves. Amen? But in the Bible, God tells us that our lives do not end in death. It's not, not the end. Death doesn't end life for anybody. Everybody that dies, in one sense, has eternal life. Because death is improperly defined if you call it cessation of life. Everybody continues to live after death. And they're going to live in one of two places. The good place, we would say, would be in the presence of God. The bad place would be one which God prepared for the devil and his angels. Now, quite naturally, no one would really want to leave this earth to spend eternity with the devil. Nobody in their right mind would. But so much confusion is out there on how to actually get to heaven to be with God. Let's just go with the assumption today that everybody here would like to go to heaven when they leave. 
We all know we're going to die. The Bible says that, but we knew it anyway. We're going to die at some point, and we'd like to go to be with God in heaven. Now, how do you get there? I don't want to be with the devil. I want to go to be with heaven, with God in heaven. And there's confusion, because you'll go to this group, and they'll teach one thing. You go to another group, they'll teach something else. And you'll get different stuff. You say, what's the right way? Well, the right way, uh, Dr. Smith was talking today about how some people <clears throat> say that the Baptist faith is the only way, and how that people say, well, John the Baptist, he was a Baptist. Jesus must have been a Baptist. He got baptized by John the Baptist. And we laugh about that and say, well, the pastor said, well, he was a Nazarene because he was from Nazareth. But the fact of the matter is, what we're looking for is good Bible doctrine. And the one thing Baptists have always stood for, it's proper definition of baptism, and the Bible as our source. So if you're hopping into a, you know, church of the open door, a local community, community church, whatever, hey, that's your business. I'm glad I'm a Baptist. Amen. Amen. I don't apologize for it. But I suppose that the normal questions would be this when it regards to salvation, in regards to salvation. What's it going to cost me to get to heaven? How much is it going to cost me? What kind of good things do I have to do to get there? How righteous must I be to gain entrance into heaven? And I suppose those are all good thoughts, but there's a problem with that line of reasoning, and here it is. None of us are good enough to get to heaven, and none of us have got enough money to buy our way in. So that line of reasoning's got a problem. When it comes to goodness, we've all got a skeleton in the closet somewhere, maybe more than one. The Bible very clearly calls these little problems. Well, I had a little problem here, preacher. Yeah, I got a little issue back here, you know. God calls those problems sin. And he says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, I've on occasion said, hey, anybody here that's never sinned, go ahead and stand up. I'm not going to say that today, but I've never had anybody stand up. I've never met a person that said they never did anything wrong. Haven't met that person. How about you? If I say all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, can I get an amen on that? It says there's none righteous, no, not one. And that's not all. The Bible tells us in Romans 6.23 that the wages of sin is death. And that's not just the physical death, but what the Bible calls the second death of woeful separation from God for all eternity in a place of eternal torment. That's what the Bible says. Whosoever is not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. You say, well, is that a cessation of life? No, it's eternal separation from God and a lack of comfort. Not what we want. Now, that's the bad news. But then there is the good news. Also in Romans 6.23, Bible says the wages of sin is death. You didn't know you're getting paid for sinning. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The gift of God. It's a Christmas season. I know I'll be getting a lot of gifts from my wife. <clears throat> Who don't like to get gifts? The gift of God is eternal life. It's often said that it's better to give than it is to receive. But I'll say this. When God is giving out the gift of eternal life, it's mighty nice to receive. Amen? Amen. The fact is that God is actually happy to give. And people should be very happy to receive. We're not good enough to earn it, but God is good enough to give it. We don't have enough money to buy it, but God has all the riches in the universe. Now that's the good news, amen? It's what's called the gospel. Over in 1 Corinthians, the Bible says, For I delivered unto you first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day 
according to the Scriptures. Now, that's the good news. And over in 1 Peter, the Bible says this, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just, that's Christ, for the unjust, that's me, that he might bring us to God. So he's once suffered for sins. One time, he died on the cross. Not every Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. One time, some 2,000 years ago, the perfect man, God in the flesh, the God-man, went to the cross of Calvary for your sins and for mine, shed his blood, paid the price, was buried and rose again, showing that he had victory over hell, death, and the grave, and that's the just for the unjust. And I thank God for it. Now, if you have your Bibles, let's go back to Romans chapter 3, verse 23. And we'll take a minute and look at some scriptures that really lay this thing right out. <clears throat> Say, well, the Mormons came by on Monday, and the Jehovah's Witnesses came by on Tuesday, the Pentecostals came by on Wednesday, and now I don't know what to do. I'm going to show you what to do. Right here, according to the Bible. Romans chapter 3. Verse 23. <clears throat> there the Bible says this. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified. All right? Made just. Declared just. Not guilty under the law. Being justified freely by His grace. We say of grace, it's his unmerited favor. It's his undeserved kindness. So being justified, made just freely, without payment, by his grace, because he made the payment. Through the redemption, that's being bought back. He made us. He created us. We've gone astray in our sin, and he bought us back. That is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation. A propitiation is to, uh, to be propitiated, we would say, is to gain or regain the favor of or goodwill of another. So propitiation is being brought back on good terms, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness, not mine, his righteousness. The Bible says, for by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The Bible says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. So it's his righteousness, not mine, for the remission, the pardon of forgiveness of sins that are past through the forbearance of God to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just, that's him without sin, and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. You say, how can God just forgive me? He's got the capacity to do so. He's perfect. You can't pay for my sins, and I can't pay for yours. I uh, <clears throat> led a lady to Christ one day, and I saw her a few weeks later, and she said, you saved me. I said, look, I couldn't save anybody, amen? I can't save anybody. I mean, if you're on the railroad tracks drunk, I can grab you and push you off. I can do that. But when you die, your destiny depends on you and the Lord Jesus Christ, not me. I can preach the word to you. I can tell you the plan of salvation, which I'm doing right now. But it's God Almighty, who is just, who has the capacity to pay for your sins and the disposition to do so. So he's just, and he's the justifier. He's both of those things. It's a wonderful thing. And the Bible goes on to say, of him which believeth in Jesus. How do I get that? You believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. So what do I do? Well, we've got an actual story of decision by way of illustration. Acts chapter 16, verse 25. 
Acts chapter 16, verse 25. <clears throat> Now, Paul has been out there serving Christ. He's been preaching the gospel, and that makes people mad on occasion. And they took him and threw him in jail. He's at Philippi. And they beat him around a little bit. In verse 25, at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. So they've been jailed, they've been beaten up. Wrongly, they didn't do anything wrong. Really, they just preached the gospel. And they've been beaten mercilessly. And the Bible says in verse 26, suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were open and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. All right, if you're under the Roman authority and you're a prisoner and you're responsible for those guys and they get away, your life is on the line. There are instances, an instance in the Bible where they killed a jailkeeper because he let his prisoners go. Or because they got away. He didn't let them go. They got away. So this jailkeeper, you know, wakes up. Man, there's been an earthquake. The doors are open. He says, I've had it. I'm not going to hang around and let the Romans kill me. I'm going to take out my sword and boom, I'm going to take away my life right now and get it over with. And Paul cried in verse 28 with a loud voice saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he, the jailer, called for light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? He saw something in the praises of Paul, in the preaching of Paul, in his compassion, all of that. He saw something, and he knew he needed something, and he came trembling in and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. That man, that night, took him to his house, washed him up, cleaned him up, and thank God he was baptized. Baptism is not salvation. In that heart belief, he became a child of God. He was saved. He was headed for heaven. You say, preacher, didn't join the church. Well, he probably baptized him into the church at Philippi. Amen. But we're not talking about church membership right now. It's a good thing. We're not ta talking about baptism. It's one of the two ordinances of God, baptism and the Lord's Supper. What we're talking about is our heart belief in Jesus Christ. He looked at a very religious man one day named Nicodemus and said, Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. Nicodemus came and said, We know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. He looked at Nicodemus right in the eye and said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Cannot see it. He'll never see it. He'll never get there. Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. Why, we look around at each other and say, well, I know that Randy was born. So how do you know that? Were you there? No, I'm looking at his body. He had a birth. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. But that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. He's talking about putting your trust in Jesus Christ. Believing. He says, is that all there is to it? Is it that simple? Well, it wasn't too simple for Jesus to make it possible, was it? A horrendous death on the cross. A compassion and love for you before the foundation of the world. Knowing that you were not able to get yourself to heaven, he came down and said, hey, I'll take care of Jerry. I'll die on the cross. I'll pay for his sins. So what will you ask in return? I'll ask him to put his trust in me. To acknowledge who I am, God Almighty in the flesh and the Lord of this universe. And when you make that decision in your heart, you become a child of the King. John 1.12 says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. He said, which is it, receiving or believing? Well, if you believe, you receive. Amen? 
You know, we don't say, hey, the house is on fire. Yeah, I believe that. No, you get out of the fire. You get out of the house. You receive it. You receive that truth. So when we really believe in Christ, it's a receiving believing. Or it's a believing receiving. So I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says the devils believe and tremble. Now, they're in a different category than we are for sure. But there is a belief. Yeah, I believe in the old man upstairs. Not the kind of faith I'm talking about, friends. I'm talking about a belief in Jesus Christ and his payment for my sins, his death, burial, and resurrection, all according to the Scriptures, the fact that he's ascended up on high, that he's coming back, and man, there's a whole new program going on. Amen? If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Boy, there's a great millennial kingdom coming out of there. There's a whole plan in God's, God's book, all revealed to us. But to be in that plan, you need to receive Christ as Lord and Savior. Now, knowing this, is it any wonder that Paul said this of his own ministry? He said, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom. He said, I don't know if I like that preacher. It doesn't seem like he's too smart. I didn't come with excellency of speech or wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. Paul said, for I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Boy, whatever the Pioneer Baptist Church is, amen? We ought to be a friendly church, and I think we are. We ought to have some fun times, have some good meals, celebrate and do all of those things. But man, we need to preach Jesus Christ and him crucified. And Paul said, I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Why? Because that's what saves men. We need to never depart from that great foundational truth. And Paul, same reason. He wrote Romans 1.16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to every one that believeth. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Hey, what are you, preacher? I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. What's that mean? It means I put my trust in Jesus Christ for my Lord and Savior. It means I don't think I can make it myself because I know better and I know me. It means that God is good. It means that he died on the cross to pay for my sins and yours. And I put my trust in him, and I want to follow him and try to live my life according to this blessed holy book. I made that decision on June 9th, 1974. Should have made it before, but I didn't know any better. I was already uh, 28 years old, I guess, or just thereabouts. But boy, I'll tell you, it changed my life. And it'll change yours, too, if you haven't made that decision. Amen, Christians? Amen. And some of you I've led to Christ myself and had the pleasure to do so, and you know what a difference it makes to be born into the family of God, to know that I'm in right relationship with God. Does that mean you're a perfect preacher? No, I'm not. You can check with my wife. She'll confirm that. But boy, I'll tell you, that little bumper sticker out there, Christians aren't perfect just forgiven. And that's a blessing of being in Christ. Christ in you, the Bible says, the hope of glory. Say, well, preacher, then what? Listen, if you've never made that decision, I can look back, I told you when I got saved. Now, maybe you say, well, preacher, I can't remember the date, but I know I was down at the donut shop and somebody gave me a track and I read it and I bowed my head and asked Christ to save me. Hey, that's good. That works, Amen. Well, preacher, I was at a men's Bible study or a ladies' Bible study, and we you know the, the leader of the group came and talked to me, and we, we prayed. Yes, I asked him to save me. I can't remember. I think it was in the winter. I can't remember the day. I know it was about 8 o'clock at night, and yes, I asked Christ to save me. That's good. But there has to be a time when you made a decision to receive Christ. You know, most people in America have a birth certificate. <clears throat> on it, you can see when they were born. Amen? When you got married, Carl and I got married, and we stood up and professed our love one to another. 
And at that point, it became official. Amen? So, look back and say, hey, all right, I was born physically right here. I got married over here first time. Married over here the second time. Married over here the third time. Married down here the fourth time, and I remember every one of them. Listen, what about your new birth? What about your new birth? Say, preacher, I don't like you. That's okay. I like you anyway. Look, don't go home today without that peace that comes from knowing you have made peace with God. That you put your trust in Jesus Christ. Boy, I'll tell you, I got saved. I had a 65 Mercury. Had a Budman sticker on the back window. I don't know who put it there. I'm driving down Broadway, Bangor, Maine. I'm driving down. I'm saying, man, if this puppy goes off the road now and I hit that telephone pole, I know I'm going to heaven. Amen. I was under conviction before that. I mean conviction. You say, what do you mean by that, preacher? I mean, before I was riding down, saying, hey, if I get killed right now and, and I end up before Jesus Christ, am I going to be able to say to him, Lord, you know I've been going to church. You know I was thinking about making a decision, right? I wonder if you'll understand. When you start thinking like that, man, you're under conviction. God is dealing with you. So if you're in that position, you say, man, my heart's something a little bit right now. That ain't me. That's the Holy Ghost telling you it's time for decision. The Bible says, behold, now is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. So what's the best time to get saved, preacher, to put my trust, to start my life anew with God? What's the best time? Right now. Right now. What if I wait an hour? Then that'll be the best time. What if I get killed before? I don't know why you're gambling. I'm too cheap to go to Vegas and gamble. Amen? Don't like gambling? Why would you gamble with your eternity? He says, come unto me. All you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He invites you to come unto him. He came all the way from heaven to earth. You know why? Because he loved you, Larry. Amen? And he didn't want you to die and go to hell. Praise the Lord, Larry made a decision to receive Christ. What a wonderful thing, man. What a great thing to be saved, huh? Amen? What a great thing to bring a baby into the world by the grace of God and say, we're going to bring him up to serve God. Man, that's where we want to be. What a difference. All the difference, not only in this life, but for all eternity. What a God. Saved my wretched soul. I should have been in hell a million times over. Thank God. Gave me a great wife and a great family. Grandkids that are saved. Man, oh man, what a life. You say, what are you saying, preacher? I'm saying, I recommend it to you. Amen? I recommend it to you. God will never hurt you. He only wants to love you and help you. you say, what have I got to do? We're going to have an invitation. You come on down. I'll pray with you. If your lady, my wife will pray with you. One of the ladies will pray with you. And man, you can just say, God, I know that I've sinned and I'm sorry. I know that Jesus Christ is God, that he died for my sins, and I want to receive him right now as my Lord and my Savior. And I ask him into my life to save me. Say, preacher, is it that simple? For us it is. Amen? One hard to get married. You take this woman to be your wife? I do. All right. Right? Same thing. And just coincidentally, by the way, do you know that believers are referred to as the bride of Christ? So I ask you, if you said I do to Christ, it's time you did. Shall we pray? Oh God, thank you. Thank you for that blessed gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you for your love and grace to us. Thank you that you didn't say, all right, Mitchell, unless you work and do this and do this and do this and give this and give that, you won't make it. Thank God that you said to me, Jerry, I have paid the way. If you'll just receive me, I'll take care of you. God, I pray nobody would leave without Christ 
as their own personal Lord and Savior. Speak to hearts, we pray, in this time of invitation. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.